Hello and welcome again to another White Horse Media program. Uh, last few days ago we did a program called Is It Time to Leave the Cities? And this is really a part two. It's a follow-up called Practical Steps to Leaving the Cities. Uh, we've had a lot of emails and Facebook posts and a lot of people that are asking a lot of questions and we're going to take your questions uh, shortly. We have some guests here to continue the discussion about city living and I know we've, we've also had some comments about the big city we have behind us and here we are talking about getting out into the country. Uh, that is a, a physical set that is not easy to change. We do want to stress that now's the time to get out of the cities and maybe at some point we'll change our background. But anyway I'm here with uh, Pastor Ron Fleck who is has been my pastor in the past uh, when we first moved up to uh, eastern Washington and North Idaho. Ron was pastoring a church in Newport, Washington. We became good friends and he was uh, a pivotal person to help us to move out of the Fresno area up into the country. And Craig Meisner and his wife Nancy, uh, they are the leaders, founders, directors, CEOs, <laughs> they don't really like that term, but they are, uh, they direct a ministry called End Time Preparedness. And uh, there's a companion ministry connected with their son, Nick and that is called sustainable preparedness, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Nick and Lisa, so this is really a family, a family affair. And so before we take questions about moving out, out of the cities and into the country, which we already talked about, uh, the importance of doing that, now we wanna talk about how to do that. Just give us a little bit of background, the two of you, on, on what you've been doing and what you're doing now. Well, we used to live in the south in Georgia and um, we operated, and I say we because Nancy and I worked very close together, operated a construction business where we built highly custom homes. And after we had built, been building for a couple of decades, uh, the homes got rather large, and we could see the materialism uh, that was creeping in. The uh, some of the customers we were uh, building for were, were very materialistic. We were materi materialistic, and we could see that things were wrapping up. Um, and we realized that this is not the work to be in, to be building mansions. These were rather large homes. We didn't want to build, we didn't want to be in something that was not conducive to the Lord coming because we realized what we were building would wind up being heaps of rubble. So we started praying for the Lord to show us what else we need to do. About two years before we um, decided to close our business, we started praying. And there were uh, some events that happened um, and also the, our desire to get out of what we were doing, the materialism we were involved in, um, kept growing until finally at one point we decided to uh, close our business and move. We did. We were praying where to move. We knew not where to go. The Lord showed us. I mean, we were really praying. <laughs> the Lord showed us in no uncertain terms uh, where to go. And he worked miracle after miracle. Um, we don't have time to go over it, but it was just absolutely amazing. And we've been there for the last 20 years now. And we live off the grid. We're about a mile and a quarter away from electricity. And it wouldn't bother me if we were 500 miles away. We love it. We have an alternative energy system. It takes a little money to put one up. But we didn't start out by owning a complete system. We started out with just a generator and had extension cords running all over the floor. Then we went into, then we were able to buy uh, an inverter and batteries and we got to where we could uh, have lights at night. And then pretty soon we could buy solar panels. And it's just wonderful. And so we have we decided to use the experiences and the knowledge that the Lord has given us over the past 45 years, especially 20 years, to try to help other people um, 
to understand what to do, what it takes to get out of the cities. Either whether you are called by the Lord to get out of the cities or to improve the area that you're living in now. Hopefully it's out of the city or not far, at least a little ways from the city. So we started a ministry with our son who was not married at the time and miracle after miracle happened. Nick started producing DVDs, highly instructional DVDs, not the kind you'd order um, online or it's not entertainment, but very instructional DVDs on all aspects of setting up uh, out of the cities. And we started traveling and giving seminars. And so here we are 20 years later with over 300 churches under our belt, giving seminars to over 300 churches and been to various countries. And um, I've got to tell you, uh, we are out in the country. We have been for 20 years. We left a, a little over 3,000 square foot home scaled down, that's very important, and now we're living in a 1,250 square foot home. We absolutely love it, and all I can say is wild horses couldn't drag us back. Right. I, mean, I was out in my backyard. Uh, I don't have my suit and my tie on today. I was trimming some of my fruit trees It's that time of year, and, and country living has been a a blessing that I cannot describe. And, and Ron, you've lived in the country most of your life. You're the operations director for White Horse Media, and you've pretty much become now the, the liaison for people that are asking questions and trying to, to get into the mountains or get into the country or get into a better, safer uh, environment. You have a new email address. Why don't you tell us that email address again? Yeah, well, it's uh, just country living at whitehorsemedia.com and really it's it's a result of just the outpouring of uh, people wanting more information as a result of our live streams here in the last in the last month um, but you know going back even to to 2008 when when you moved up here I think it was 2008 yes correct um, as we remember the economy took a big hit uh, just like it's doing now and we had a plethora of calls uh, at that time of people wanting information. They would contact our church. They, they knew that, you know, we had a nice little conservative church up here in the country and, and they would call us. And so, um, yeah, just kind of by default, I've kind of taken on that role. And as of late, it's kind of revamped again. And so uh, country living at whitehorsemedia.com and you know, we're not making any promises to, you know, say, hey, come stay right here, but we're here to, to help in any way that we can. That's right. We're thinking more and more about helping people. Right. And that's why we're doing this. And, and Craig and Nancy, you've been involved in this, as you mentioned, 300 churches you've had seminars in. Your website, give us your website again. Endtimepreparedness.com. Okay, endtimepreparedness.com and your son's Website, <laughs> right, and those are both on the PDF sheet at the bottom of this video. You can click and you can see the resources. That's sustainablepreparedness.com. <laughs> right, and your and both of your websites are really they go together, and they're really portals uh, to information about a whole host of topics. Uh, this is not yes. an easy subject. You can't just summarize it in five minutes. But we we all know what it's like to live in the city. We all live in the country now. Uh, we we love it. We would never go back. Absolutely. Uh, our families are here. We're so blessed. And White Horse Meat is blessed to have all of this uh, equipment to be able to continue to do these programs. And we do want to take questions in just a little bit. Uh, why don't you show us also your, your book? Mention your book that goes into all kinds of details, uh, A to Z, because a lot of people just, know, just don't know what to do. They don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And we don't have all the answers, but we want to point people in a direction that can get them started so they can start looking at options, looking at uh, different uh, sources of information so they can start taking steps. And we don't know where you're going to land. We don't know where God wants you. We didn't know God wanted us uh, where he brought us, but we've stepped out in faith. And the benefits of living in a country environment surrounded by nature instead of buildings 
uh, the benefits are just off the charts. Amen. And we want to share those benefits with others. So mention your book. Well, this it's Sustainable <coughs> Preparedness <coughs> is the name of it, written by Craig and Nick and myself. And this is something we just poured into it, everything we could think of that would help people to learn quickly the lessons that we didn't always learn quickly and we didn't always, we sometimes had to learn the hard way. So we did, uh, covered many, many different topics and it's jam-packed with information. Uh, for instance, the titles of the chapters, the first steps, making a living in the country is the second one because that's an extremely important aspect when you're moving. How are you going to be able to make a living? And by the way, I was just thinking in the last couple of weeks with this um, pandemic, it has made a difference to many people who didn't think they could work from home, but with the whole situation, mm. their companies have helped them and uh, actually uh, caused them to work at home. And that may make a big change in more people being able to work from their home in the country. Mm -hmm. But finding your country property, we have many, many different things to look for. We want, when people move, we want it to be a success. We don't want um, them to make mistakes that are critical when they're uh, choosing property. And then we have uh, a chapter on the home grocery store, which is your garden and your orchard. And then becoming energy independent, independent water systems, heating with wood, and more. And it's just jam-packed with a lot of information that goes along with the DVDs that our son has produced also. And the DVDs, uh, is there a cost for those? Or are those, yes. can they just? Mm -hmm. No, they are, mm -hmm. they are l many of the DVDs, the gardening sets are 12 to 14 hours of intense instruction from experts. We ourselves on the gardening aspect, when we first had our garden, it was like a little peewee garden. It was tiny little little plants and we knew our soil must need help. And we said, we need help. And so <laughs> we actually contacted experts and went to those experts and filmed them with their permission, teaching us so that in turn others could learn and We've had fabulous gardens for the last, mm -hmm. I don't know how long, just wonderful gardens. Sure, and we want to stress that they're just as, as the whole pandemic with the coronavirus, people are talking about flattening the curve, you know, trying to uh, lessen the spread of the virus. And so <coughs> the reality is that there's a, there's a learning curve to moving in the country. I've been up here for about 12 years and I, I didn't know how to run a chainsaw when I got up here. I'd never split wood. Uh, well, maybe a couple times uh, at Weimar in Northern California where I worked up there, but I grew up in the Hollywood Hills and I, you know, I didn't have a garden, didn't know how to really do any of the things that I'm, I'm doing now up here in the mountains. And it's been a big learning curve, but it's been great. It's just been wonderful. And uh, it's like the Christian life, you know, the Bible talks about growing in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. And so we learn more about God and about Jesus the more we read the Bible. And as you live into the in the country, uh, you learn as you go, and the blessings uh, are are off the charts. Uh, here's a verse I think I read in the last our last program about time to leave the cities. Uh, Genesis chapter two verse eight says, "The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed." And that just impress. I've I've thought about that verse a lot many times when I'm out working outside that. God's original plan <coughs> was, was the garden. It was, a, it was the country to be surrounded by nature and to commune with him, to learn more of his power, his works, his love, his goodness. And even though now we're on this side of the fall and we're down closer and closer to the very end of time, the last crisis, uh, we strongly believe at Whitehorse Media, we all believe this, that country living is very uh, powerful and, and advantageous in helping us to develop characters that will be able to stand firm for Jesus when the final crisis hits. Yes. So we're not talking about doing this just because we want to uh, isolate ourselves and live as hermits. It's because we want to be closer to God. We want to do his will. We want to uh, have a stronger relationship with Jesus so that we can, we can act a part in the final scenes of this world's history. And we believe that country living is definitely uh, part of that program, Amen. part of that plan. So we're here to take questions and the Meisners and, and uh, Pastor Ron, they are resources 
uh, resources with a vast amount of information. Uh, as we mentioned, you know, we're, we're not realtors and we can't uh, promise, you know, that we can exactly direct you to the right place, but God can do that. Mm -hmm. And the important Amen. thing, as you mentioned, Craig, earlier, as we were t uh, talking before we started, that the important thing to do is to get started and to pray and to seek God's guidance, yes, to ask him to help you, mm -hmm. and then to take steps in that direction and then watch the Lord lead. And he has places all over the country and he's got people, he's got resources, but we have to do our part and we have to, we have to step out in faith. Yeah. You know, Steve, one of the reasons that we're, we're doing this, this program is not only because we think that it's time to leave the cities, but we're seeing so many people reach out to ministries such as yours. You mentioned to me earlier that uh, over the, the last few months and, and lately the last few days, people have been contacting you. Uh, there's a movement. The Lord is moving upon the hearts of people to make this move. And so we are doing this program because out of a, a necessity, a need. What, what, you know, we don't have all the answers, but we have some answers. And maybe in the eyes of some, we're experts. When, when in reality, every day we're, we're learning new things. Mm -hmm, sure. uh, whether you've been here 20 years or, right. or 12 years or even one year. Yeah. Um, and time's running out. You know, there's no guarantee that if you are able to make that move, that you will have 20 years to develop your skills. Okay. And, uh, and, and really, there's not been a better time, uh, an easier time in the sense that uh, we have the access, we have the internet to access, and you can find anything anymore on the internet, good and bad. But we've already got a lot of questions uh, coming in, and should we go yeah, ahead yeah, and dive be, in? Before we do, wanna... before we do, j just uh, give me just a, a <coughs> basic steps, just a few steps in, in a short, the short version of uh, practical steps, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, as people begin that journey, and then we'll go to our questions. Craig or Nancy, either one of you. Well, I anticipated this question okay. because it's uh, very important. And head and shoulders over any other step, the first step is to go to the Lord and ask for his direction. Mm -hmm. I would never, I would never try this without asking the Lord's direction. And I found in some books that I really enjoyed reading, uh, a person wrote steps uh, wrote out steps uh, to know God's will. And she gave three steps. Number one was study his word, the Bible. That's very crucial. I remember when I had the construction business, I'd deal with a lot of problems. Most of the problems was with dealing with human beings, customers and personnel. And I remember Sometimes in the mornings when I read the, the Word, read the Bible, and I don't read it enough, but I remember there'd be some days that I'd read His Word, and it was wonderful, but little did I know that what I was reading would be the answer to some of the problems I would face later on that afternoon. And it wouldn't even have anything to do with what I read. It's just incredible about the importance of reading God's Word. The number two, recognize His providential workings. Number three, follow the appeals of the Holy Spirit. That is step number one. Go to God first in prayer for guidance. Number two is have a goal. Um, to me, a, a goal I would have in contemplating a move to a place outside of a city, or you might live outside the city already. That goal would be to make sure you're in a position to have your independent wood supply, your independent heat, and your independent food supply. Remember, that's most important. Your independent water supply, your independent heat, and your independent food. And Craig, you mentioned that people don't have to get all that right away. No. Right? I mean, even looking for property, renting a place before you buy, uh, networking with other people in the area, mm -hmm. and there's a whole series of steps, <clears throat> and, there's, and there's a lot of variety. 
Yes. Uh, it's not that everybody has to follow a, a cookie cutter uh, program, but you're, you're just giving you know, goals that, that would be kind of a long-term goal is to have those, yes. have those needs met. When we first moved, Steve, we had very little money because we paid everything off. We had a lot of loans and we realized we need to get debt free. So we did, and we had a little bit left over. We had enough to build a small cabin, a home, uh, to pay the property off. We bought 10 acres. We're blessed to have the 10 acres with a beautiful mountain creek flowing across the property. And we had just enough money to build a 1,250 square foot, roughly, home, put a roof over us, and we didn't even have windows to put, we didn't even put siding on. We couldn't afford siding on the house. We had a, a friend, uh, a builder friend who uh, called up and he said, hey, I've got some old windows that I've been replacing from homes and um, I'll give them to you if you want. And so that's where our windows came from for the most part. So, and I, I could tell you story after story, but we don't have time for that. The Lord is, he is such a loving God. And you need to have your independent water, heat, and food, not only for yourself, but for others. And then the next step is try to decide if you feel that you are going to move to another part of the country. Uh, decide where to move. Uh, pray about it, of course, all along. But where do you move? Where do you move to where you can have your independent water supply, independent heat, uh, independent food? Well, wherever you move, you need to move to a place where there is an abundance of water, where you can get water. So what I recommend is having a forestation, finding a forestation map. Forestation map meaning it shows you where the trees are in the country. Then get a topographical map. Topographical map shows you where the mountains are and where they are not. And then also get a population map. You know what that will show you. And some ways superimpose those three maps on each other. And what you'll wind up with is a picture of the country that shows you where forestation is. That means water and where there are mountainous areas um, and then also where there are fewer people. You need to have water. Anyway, I could go on. Uh, but just what I gave you left off, and I send you to this book, not because I'm trying to sell this book, but we put our all in this book, and it has a lot of information. It kind of picks up where I just left off and help you. Okay, perfect. And as we, as we mentioned, th this this program is really a portal. Their website is a portal. Their book is a portal to a lot of information. And there's a verse in Proverbs. Uh, my wife and I really, it means a lot to us when we first met, when we first got married. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. So that's where we acknowledge God, we acknowledge His Word, we acknowledge Jesus, we pray for the Holy Spirit. We ask God to lead us, we surrender our lives to Him, and then He promises that He will direct our paths. As we move forward, He'll guide us this direction, this direction, this part of the country, that part of the country, and He'll lead us uh, step by step to, to the blessings that He has in store for us as we strengthen our spiritual lives and as we prepare for the soon return of Jesus Christ. So, uh, Ron, I think, unless you have any other, anything else you'd like to, like to chip in before we go to our questions? Yeah, well, we've got uh, several questions coming in. Um, just kind of along those lines, you know, looking at mm -hmm. maps and, you know, trying to figure out where someone might move. Uh, a lot of the people that I've talked to in the recent weeks, they've already, you know, over a course of a life, you're, you're gonna travel around the country and here and there, and, and people kind of have an idea. Or, you know, they have that, boy, if I could, boy, I'd love to live there, yeah. you know, sometime. And even, even in your experience, uh, being invited to come up to the Pacific Northwest, it was kind of someone kind of came out of the blue right. and said, hey, if you came up, we providential. It was yeah, unexpected. So, <clears throat> so the Lord has many different ways of showing us where he would like us to be. 
Right. And uh, so sometimes it's just recalling that place that you'd really love to be. But we've got a lot of questions. <coughs> uh, the first one here is from uh, Marion, who says, why do we have to flee to the woods? And I would like to uh, take a stab at that, that question. Um, on the screen here, if uh, we could switch over to that real quick. This was my view this morning. Uh, from where I stayed last night, and I would say, why wouldn't you want to flee <laughs> to yeah. a place like that? Now, uh, it, what we're saying here is not that you, that's good on that, uh, we don't always have to flee to the woods, right? We're, we're not saying that you have to flee to the, the highest mountain that you can find, um, but certainly uh, the woods and, and the mountains are one area that offer some of the things that we're looking for, especially in this time that we're we're leading to, but what do you think? Why do we have to, would you agree to that? Do we have to flee the woods or are there other options for us? Well, I think there's a lot of options. Uh, the question reminds me again of <coughs> Genesis chapter 19 when Lot was stuck in Sodom. He had pitched his tent towards Sodom. He'd made a mistake and moved his family step by step into a big city. The city was full of uh, immorality the time finally came when the people of that city had crossed the line in the sight of God, that hidden boundary, they say, between his patience and his wrath. And it was time for judgments to fall upon, upon that city. And so uh, God sent two angels to get Lot and his family out, out of there. And there's a verse, if I can put my finger on it, where uh, the angels told him to flee. Here it says, uh, verse Genesis 19:17. The angel said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you, neither stay in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. <laughs> yeah. So when the question is, you know, why should we flee to the woods? Uh, the angel told Lot, you need to get out of the city because it's a wicked city. It was full of immorality and it was time for that city to be destroyed. And we know from our study of the Bible that uh, the time is going to come when judgments are going to fall upon these cities. Uh, because they're, they're centers of wickedness, in incredible, evil centers of wickedness. And as we get closer to the coming of Jesus and to the final judgments of God upon uh, wickedness, you know, we don't want to be in the middle of wickedness. We want to be out as much as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to be in a place like, like that. Amen. You know, the cities around us, uh, think of the country, Ron, that you just showed. Uh, it's just, it's better for us spiritually. Now, again, I want to stress that we're not saying we're saved by the country. We're saved by uh, getting out of the city. We're saved through Jesus Christ. Right. But uh, God started with man in a garden. And God has warned us in the Bible about his judgments to fall upon centers of wickedness. And we, we just believe that getting out into the country is the best thing for our spiritual lives and, and for our children, for our families. And so that's why we encourage it. <laughs> it is. Um, I don't look at it as fleeing from or fleeing to the woods. I look at it as fleeing from the city. Um, look at what's going on right now. Do you need any more proof? It, it seems to me, from what I have observed, uh, the biggest problems with this pandemic um, is usually in the populated areas. When we first moved out and we lived in a a gated community had over 2,200 homes. Even though it was a suburb, it was like a city. And when we finally got out, it was wonderful. We, well, I'll, I'll just say this. I was born and raised in the South, and it gets pretty hot where we were living. And we wound up here in North Idaho, where you can have snowpack on the ground for many months. And so it was a new way of life for me. Um, and I remember um, our son, who was single at the time, uh, he had very good hearing, much better than I do. And he could, it was so quiet that he could hear snowflakes hit the snowpack, fall on the mm -hmm. snowpack. Uh, we would lay in bed at night and we would hear coyotes off in the distance. Um, you go to the city and you hear sirens. We call those city coyotes. 
it is when you leave the cities there is so much um, how can I say this uh, there's so much going on the airwaves are full of electrical waves um, I'm not wording that properly but everything is seems to be an agitation when you move to the city I, we have a good friend who when they moved out he said it took him two weeks before he heard the birds sing it's incredible the peace that you have when you move out into the city and like I'm we were talking country. earlier I mentioned um, that verse means so much more to me the verse that says um, be still and know that I'm God. Know that He is God. And I didn't really realize what that word, what it meant when it said be still. When you move to the country, you'll begin to understand how to be still. And then you'll understand God better. And it's like the, the Bible talks about the transition from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. And we also need to experience a similar transition from the artificial to the natural. You know, it goes along with that. Yes. Uh, God has surrounded us with the works of nature. And we're so, generally, we're so disconnected. You know, growing up in the Hollywood Hills, surrounded by Studio City and North Hollywood. I went to North Hollywood High, and, and I was just surrounded by the city lights, the entertainment, the seductive uh, music, and the concerts, and the, the wine, the women, the song, you know, all of that. And getting out into the country has just been, it's just been a, uh, it's become like an anchor to help me personally to strengthen my walk with Jesus and to have my mind just, just cleaned out mm -hmm. from all of the garbage and the cesspool and the, the wickedness of the past. And, and just to learn to be, uh, as you said, to be still and know that God, that He is God and to be content with the things of, of nature and the simple, the simple joys of life. Mm -hmm. It's just such a blessing. Yes. A, family, I'm sorry, a family member put it in a nutshell and I'll be brief. Um, he said in the city, man is big and things around you are small. God is small. Yes, I'm sorry. In the city, God, is, uh, man is big and God is small mm -hmm. in the country. Man is small and God is big. And that's great. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, before we go to our next question, um, you know, city living is very convenient for a lot of people, and they can't imagine why they would give up that. <laughs> but when you move to the country, when you talk with people who have made that transition, it's interesting to hear their experience saying, why have I not done this sooner? You know, we're, we're under stay-at-home orders here in, like, the rest of the country. But what that means to us is we can go hike, we can, you know, go work in the garden, we can go out and, and do these things. We're not, we're not confined, you know, to the... To a to room what's... with four walls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyway... Right. It's like marriage, yeah. Ronnie. So it's like, you know, <coughs> I got married when I was 41, and finally after I got married, and then when I had Seth, my wife and I had Seth, and then Abby... I, you know, I, I was afraid to get married. I was afraid to have that kind of responsibility. I had cold feet. And then on the other side of marriage, I thought, you know, where have I been? <laughs> yeah. You know, wh why did I wait so long? And thankfully yeah. I did because I, and I found the one for me, which was Kristen. And then now we have our two children. But on the other side of marriage and children, and then I realized how wonderful this is. Yeah. And it's the same thing with moving into the country. Oh, yes. You know, on the other side of, of that hurdle, and getting into the getting into uh, places where we're surrounded by God's nature, you think, well, you know, where have I been? Yeah. You know, why have I waited so long? Yeah. And uh, also, it's some people think, well, what do you do out there? You know, I mean, it must be so boring. And uh, when we talk about being still, everything being still and all, it's a different it's a different way of life. Um, you're doing plenty of things but you have time to think a lot of the time when you're doing them. I absolutely look forward to my time in the garden. I do our garden and I love it because 
it's just a special time with God. And I love to see how those plants grow and, and produce and, and then how I can, you know, use them and, and preserve them and all. But that time out in nature with God is one of those still times. And I'm busy doing things. It's not that I'm not, but it's a time when God can speak to me about things in a very special way. That's right. Nancy, I think that boredom is often a reflection of uh, saturation over the artificial and the entertainment, yeah. Yeah. the fast-paced things that we're exposed to, so mm -hmm. that when we don't have that stimulation, yeah. we're bored. But if we take that away from us, and then we learn a, a, a different way of living, so that we're not so saturated with the things that are artificial, yeah. then uh, you don't you don't say that as much. No, you don't no. say I'm bored. Mm -hmm because there's plenty of things to do. <laughs> You're doing you know, real country. things too. When we had our construction business, I would be so busy. And this is back when we ate meat. I, for lunch, I wouldn't even have time to go home. I'd stop, buy a hamburger, have that in one hand, a drink sitting down between my legs in the truck, in my pickup, and then fries in the other hand. And then I would use a part of my arm to steer with and that's the way I ate lunch many times. Um, I was busy, I thought. But when you move to the country and you start your garden and you cut your wood and everything else associated with country living, you're not going to be bored, I guarantee. Not going to be bored. You're going to be doing wonderful things like you were uh, alluded to a while ago, Steve. You're going to be doing character building chores. Well, let's move on. We have another question here. This one is from Gil. If someone can't get out of the city, what can or what will happen? So we probably, you probably hear this a lot. I, I've gotten some of these calls in the past. I want to move out, but I can't. What's going to happen to those who end up staying in the city? Well, first of all, I question the word can't. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't. I'm not sure that's true. I mean, people may think they can't, but when, as Craig mentioned, once we start seeking God and praying and spending time with the Lord and asking for His, for his guidance, uh, you know, Jesus says nothing shall be impossible. So I think we're limited by our own thinking that this is impossible, I can't do it. Uh, you know, Gabriel said, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Mm -hmm. Now, what will happen to those who, who stay in the cities? I think if God is impressing you to leave, and if those impressions have been there for a while or he's been trying and you uh, don't move forward in that direction, you know, the, the consequences. I mean, God wants what's best for us. It's not that he's just going to fold his hands and say, OK, you haven't obeyed me. Now I'm going to punish you. It's more that you're going to experience consequences. There are consequences to not doing God's will. There's consequences to uh, being in situations where we are surrounded by temptation and the artificial and things the things of this world that we're going to we're going to be pulled down easier and so you know it's hard to answer that question Ron to say yeah. you know what's going to happen to that person but I would still question uh, the word can't you know I don't think it it is it is impossible I think we have indication as well uh, that there will come a time when there will be a, a literal fleeing from the cities. And so maybe that's, you know, if you don't leave that, you might be one of those who are actually just running with just a shirt on your back. Right. And maybe um, right now they, they can't get out because yeah. of the fact that they're, we're in this corona lockdown. Yeah. But we don't think this is going <coughs> to continue. Uh, most likely it's going to to lift at some point and you know the door the window will be open how big that window is mm -hmm. is the window getting smaller nobody knows but I think a lot of people are being impressed as they're looking around that time is running out and we need to we need to step fast when the opportunity uh, opens when God opens up the door I have a wonderful you brought that quote that we were looking at yesterday about how God wants us to expect big things from him. Mm -hmm. He wants us to ask for big things. So if your situation looks impossible, you're just right in the right place to ask big things of him. Do you have that quote? 
No, I it don't. said we. It was to the effect that we tend to think more about what man can do, and we forget about what God can do. Yeah. That He wants us to ask big things of Him. Okay, here it is. We need to have far less confidence in what man can do, and far more confidence in what God can do for every believing soul. That's from Christ Object Lessons 146. But following that, if you look that up, it says he wants us to ask big things from him. And I just, I love that. I can, I can imagine what the Israelites were thinking as they're pinned up against the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a hopeless situation mm -hmm. they were in. Right, we can't go anywhere. Oh, we're, we're stuck. We're doomed. Uh, why do we even come? And the next thing they know, they're walking on dry land through an ocean that opened up. That's right. I, most of the majority of the people that I have talked with and that I know that have moved out of the city, they all were in this, I don't know how this is going to happen. Yep. We can't do it. And, but they moved forward. And sometimes it happened relatively quick. Sometimes it was uh, over the course of months and even a few years, mm -hmm. the Lord made it happen. So all things are possible. Uh, That's right. Could I add to that right sure. quick, Ron? Uh, it reminds me of the story in the Bible when the Israelites were about to cross the River Jordan into Canaan. And I guess this was, I assume this was in the springtime. Uh, maybe the river was swollen, I don't know. You know what a river looks like when it's smoke, swollen trees that are on the river bank or growing up out of standing in water, et cetera. And it probably looked very ominous. And here they had this swift flowing, I suppose at the time, swift flowing River Jordan between them and the promised land. Did they sit there and they say, you know, we can't do this. Uh, even though 40 years before they had had the miracle of the Red Sea uh, parting. But they had faith. They walked down to that river, and the Bible says, it, I'm not wording it, uh, quoting it exactly, but they stepped into the water. It didn't part until they stepped into the water. And then it parted. Yeah. And we're not saying to move rashly. Move smart, not rashly. But just remember this, those Israelites put their foot into the water first. And it reminds me of what you said this last weekend, which I really like. Um, you can't steer that car until it starts moving forward. And I think, you know, thinking about the, uh, the spies, the 10 spies came back and said, we can't do this. And then Caleb and Joshua said, with God's help, yes, we can. That's right. Right. And thinking about the wilderness in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, it's talking about all the things that happened in the wilderness or many of those things when the Israelites were wandering. And then verse 11 says, now all these things happened to them for examples, and they are written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the 40 years of Israel in the wilderness was written for our instruction. And over and over and over and over again, as they were journeying toward the, the promised land, the land of milk and honey and flowing streams and all the beautiful things of nature, uh, they, they ran into obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. They said, we don't have enough food. We don't have enough water. We're going to die out here. We should have gone back. We should go back to Egypt. And God allowed them to get to those points over and over again to teach them the importance of trusting him and going yeah. forward. Yeah. And that's the lesson that we all need to learn. And th all of that is for our instruction right now as we are nearing the end of the world. Right. Well, uh, Steve, this might be directed your way. Jason asks, what do you think is the next event to happen in Bible prophecy? So where are we in the scope of prophecy uh, in the Lord's soon return? Yeah, we're, we're in the red. <laughs> we're in the red. Yeah, if you look at the image of Daniel 2, we're in the toenails. <laughs> we are in the very closing moments of time. We're in the end of the time of the end. And Amen. what I think is going to happen next is going to be a sequence of terrible disasters. That's what I think. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, those disasters, those calamities, and I think the coronavirus could very well be part of that sequence. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a sequence of events that's going to bring this world 
to its knees, or at least many people, and it's going to result in this, uh, this satanic cooperation to try to get us out of this crisis, which is going to result in a false solution, which is going to be the mark of the beast. So prophetically, we're looking for the forming of the image of the beast and the enforcing of the mark of the beast. And what is going to precipitate those prophecies being fulfilled, I believe personally, is going to be a sequence of uh, rapid fire, catastrophic events yeah. where a lot of people die. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's the way I see it. And I, don't, I can't go into the details of what exactly is going to happen. Who would have thought uh, three months ago that we'd be in a stay-at-home lockdown in North Idaho? Yeah. In None of economy. us would have thought that. And our economy would be yeah. in such a condition. And the airlines <coughs> and the, key, uh, the cruise industry and, you know, states closing their borders. I mean, we never would have imagined this, but it happened fast. And things are going to happen fast. We know that the final movements will be rapid ones. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what I see coming. Yeah. More disasters. I found it interesting in, in watching the news and watching, uh, you know, the internet. What's what's happening? You you see, this is a worldwide event that we are in, mm -hmm. right? This is this is no 9/11. This is no economic crash of 2008. This is a worldwide event. Everybody's doing the same thing. Countries are following each other. Governors are following, you know, so er this is a worldwide event. And in prophecy, we find that wording in the whole world followed the beast. Right. And so this is very much a, a different scenario that we're in. And this is why we're very um, concerned, right? We're concerned about right. our brothers and sisters who are still in the cities because we see before our very eyes the the clamping down on the cities, mm -hmm. the, 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 the crime, the, the food, air, air, all these things are, be, I would be very stressed if I lived in a city right now. Yeah. Oh, well, Matter of fact, I, I would already be out. I wouldn't be, yeah. I'd just be in my backpack. Yeah. And, and, if, and if people don't know God, if they yeah. don't have the Bible, uh, you know, it's a nightmare. Yeah. So wanna, we all need the Lord and we want to stress that uh, 200%. Yeah. And I want to add that if you really want to experience peace beyond all understanding. Living in the country away from this mess going on throughout the country, especially in the cities, uh, it is, Nancy and I just thank the Lord all the time uh, because we can sit in our home out in the mountains and watch this thing going on. Um, and we feel like the Lord has blessed us and taken us where we are. Now, I'm not saying there's salvation through location, but the peace that passeth all understanding is there for you that you, you can't begin to understand in the city. There, there's a verse, Ron, before you go to the next question, I'm trying to find it. I believe it's in Mark chapter one. We, you know, we, we want Jesus to be our example and um, not putting my finger, oh, here it is. Mark 1, 35 says, In the morning, rising up a great while before the day, Jesus went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Mm -hmm. Jesus felt a need to be in a quiet place. And no doubt he was surrounded by, by nature when he had his, uh, his morning times with God. And so that's what we need. We need that quiet time with the Lord in the midst of the, the busyness and the uh, artificiality and the, the noise and the craziness of this world. You know, Satan's trying to just overwhelm our senses and overwhelm our, our bodies with the stresses and the strains of the cares of this life. And God is calling us to a place of quiet and, uh, and prayer and spending time with him. Well, let's move on. We got a lot of questions okay, and I, I hope that we can get through them all because okay. that's why we're having this for these people and I think we can. So here, uh, the next question, no name, says, I look at different areas, but I have to be aware of racial tensions and religious groups. How do you make that move with that as a factor? So it sounds like this person is maybe concerned uh, you know, with the racial tensions, we got political tensions, all this stuff. Um, I would, I would say that 
the cities probably have more than this That's than right. we do. Our local church here is made up of every walk of life. That's right. Filipinos, black. Yeah. And um, Caucasian. Uh, so, you know, maybe may, uh, it's, and I'm not saying it's not a concern, but when you move out into these open areas, people are more interested in helping their neighbors than they are, you know, getting down on them or seeing that they're different. It's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. You know, when we first moved into the country here north of Priest River, uh, if something would have happened, we were the only ones without a garden. All my neighbors had gardens. They were all, some of them were set up for power outages. And so uh, neighbors around here uh, are very important. And our church is, is very diverse here in this area, I think is very open. But it is a concern, um, maybe as you travel around to these different churches, um, you hear that concern. Do you yes. have anything oh, yes. to add to that? Or what would you recommend to this, well, this I, person? I remember distinctly being in uh, a huge city once. And it was... Uh, brought up the the issues about the fear of racial uh, problems should they move out and after talking to a number of people and after talking to people that had moved out Craig would would seek them out and would ask them are you having problems and every single one of them that I can remember said no we are not God is just we thought we would and we're not and God is just opening the door and we're having wonderful experiences and we came to the conclusion that this is one of the great deceptions of Satan he wants to scare people into thinking that if I move mm -hmm. out I'm going to have all these racial issues we have personally talked to many many people of different races and we have not found that to be the case and like like Ron said our church is multicultural it wasn't always that way, but it has been as people have been coming out of the city, and it is absolutely wonderful. Amen. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think there's, there's no perfect place on earth. Right. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be something. I mean, we're even in our area. You know, we're not free from crime entirely. Mm -hmm. There's always a risk. There, are, there is some prejudice, I'm sure, but comparatively speaking, compared to Los Angeles, where I where I'm from. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot less, you know, we don't have gangs up here in, in Newport and Priest River that I'm aware of as compared to Los Angeles or many places in the cities. And so there's, there's no guarantee, there's nothing perfect this side of heaven, but there's a lot less of these problems in the country than in the, uh, in the city. And I wouldn't let that concern stop them from looking at options and, and moving forward. You know, we've been, as Nancy, uh, alluded to, we've been to a lot of of black churches around the nation. We've been to huge churches. We've been to Oakwood University several times. And every place I sense, and I do talk with individuals there, we talk one-on-one -on -one after our seminars or whatever, and they really do have concerns about moving out into the country. Uh, is there prejudice, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got to remember that God loves every one of us. And if he told us to get out of the cities, would he not help you do that? Would he not pave a way? And like Nancy said, I keep checking with friends of mine that are black and asking who have moved out. Uh, is everything going okay? You guys haven't, uh, are you having any problems or whatever? Every time I hear no problem whatsoever. Uh, the Lord loves you. This is the last thing um, that you need to let the devil um, threaten you with. Because mm -hmm. the devil will do that. He will make you think that you're going to really face a lot of prejudice in the country. There might be a few people that might give you some problems, but just remember God loves you and he wants you out and he'll take care of you. We often um, show some short video clips at some of our seminars of people giving a little testimony and one that just came to my mind was a young man. He was an LPN and uh, a, a black gentleman and he had moved out with his family and he had, first of all, he hadn't had the money 
But then the Lord worked that out for him, and he had found this property, and he got it. But he was really concerned because he had a neighbor that t uh, had a rebel flag flying on his car. And he said, I looked at that, and I thought, oh, boy. And he didn't know what to do. And he said one time he came in contact with that neighbor for the first time. And the neighbor said, well, look, you, your tires are all messed up. And he said uh, he, that, that uh, neighbor that had the rebel flag on his car ended up changing his tires for him. And then he bought a new set. Of bought tires a new for set. And, and what else did he do? And changed them. And then he said uh, another neighbor's had wood, and uh, already already cut, already seasoned. He said I had plenty of wood because he got 30 acres. This this young man, but he said I had plenty of wood. But he said it wasn't seasoned. And another neighbor stepped up and said, Here, I got more wood than I need. You can have some of mine. So he said instead of it being a negative, it was a positive. I just want to finish by saying this to add to what Nancy was saying. If you follow the Lord's leadings, you will be shocked at how the Lord opens the way for you. Yeah. The fears that you had will, will be proven wrong. The devil wants you to fear. But when you get out and obey the Lord, you're going to be shocked at how he opens the way and blesses you. Right. Kind of goes along with this next question. What do you do if you only have $500 to your name? How is that possible to move out and buy 30 acres or five acres or, or whatever? If you've only got, you know, a few shekels in your pocket, how are you going to make that, that happen? And, and I guess we could just easily point back and say, you know, all things are possible. And if you have faith, and again, many stories uh, you, you could tell of people who have not had anything. Right. Um, start out as maybe just renting and maybe you're caretaking a piece of land and over the course of time you work out a deal and you know there's just all kinds of uh, scenarios that are out there but um, can people move out if they don't have any money? Yeah, when, when we first moved up here I think I've mentioned this we didn't have a lot of money. <clears throat> Our family didn't have a lot of money and the ministry didn't have a lot of money and we really stepped out in faith. Uh, to come up here. It was a, an entirely new world for us, but we, we just sensed the Lord leading us at that time out of California, mm -hmm. and we moved forward. And there were, there were days, there were times when I didn't get paid. Uh, paycheck came, or the time came for my paycheck, and I didn't get a paycheck. I and then, and then two weeks later, I was supposed to get paid, and I didn't get a paycheck. So I remember, you know, a couple of times right in a row and I was thinking, Lord, how am I going to feed my family? How am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to buy food? Uh, and it just put me on my knees and God used, he uses difficult times to teach us lessons. I think we have a lot of times we have this uh, mistaken belief that if God is with us and leading us, that everything is just going to be rosy and that everything is just going to fall into place and we won't have any trials. We won't have difficulties. But that's, that's not true. I heard a story once a long time ago about a, 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 a dad who had a little girl and the little girl was struggling to put her dress on and she, she was just a little thing like maybe you know four or five years old and she was having a real hard time and, and someone was watching and said, why don't you ask your dad to help you? And she said, oh, my dad often just lets me struggle. <laughs> he lets me struggle. Mm -hmm. And it's just a simple lesson there that, that uh, God teaches us lessons through trials right. and difficulties that we could never have learned any other way. And on the other side of those things, we understand the blessings. Well, the, this question comes close to home. Um, uh, I know he's watching and I hope he doesn't mind um, me sharing this, but our son, um, while living at home, before he got married, the time had come and he uh, felt he needed to leave home, leave the nest. So, but he didn't have any money. And he says, I didn't, I don't, I didn't have two nickels to rub against each other. <laughs> so he decided to, you know, he'd been praying about it, and like we mentioned before, Steve, he decided to get that car run, uh, rolling and then he'll do the steering 
or let the Lord do the steering, but he wanted to get the car rolling. So he started going out and, and looking, uh, and it was in this area, looking for land, houses, or whatever. And try to make a long story short, he wound up leasing a cabin that was heated with wood, had a wood-burning cook stove in it, and a, spect a spectacular view of the mountains. And, um, and he set up a lease with the owner, and the lease was just really a good price. Um, and so he moved in. Like I said, he didn't have two nickels to rub against each other. But now that he's married, has two children, uh, now he is living on 10 acres, has a, a big shop, a home, and a million dollar view of the mountains. And they hope to have it paid off in less than a year. This is a man that started off a few years ago and he didn't know where it'd wind up, but the Lord directed, he exercised his faith. And I wanna add, the reason he had no money when he started was he invested everything he had in this work that we're doing. Craig was putting food on the table, Nick was earning money, but he was putting everything into God's work. And I just have to add, uh, he told that story once when we were at a church deep in, in New York City. And uh, the people there were, they rent, they didn't have any money, they don't even have a car. Because in New York City, the parking is so expensive, most of them don't even have a car. And so here we were, and it was our Sunday morning, we were getting ready to start the practical, and we'd already covered the spiritual aspects, and these folks wanted to go, but they didn't have the means. And Nick told that story. And he said, would anybody be willing to tell me approximately what your, uh, it was probably rent, but what their housing cost a month? And they came up with some figures, maybe around 2000, 2200. And Nick said, well, I want to tell you, when I g found that house to lease and I contacted the owner, she said to me, what I would like for you to do is pay the property taxes and maintain the house. And that's it for a year. That amounted to about $600. So he said- A year. A year. So he said to this group there at the church, he said, so what, what I pay in a year, most of you are paying in just a couple of weeks time. And he wanted them to see that God knows their situation better than they know it themselves. And he can work out the details yes. if you go forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not easy but it can be done. Mm -hmm. City living, if you add it all up, is I think more expensive than country living. Oh, yes. It's just it making is. that move, finding something that you can do in the country. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are ways that you can find deals like this. And I've been on the phone with a few people uh, sharing, you know, just simply going to Craigslist and looking under housing. And some people are looking for people to caretake their properties. You, you might see a place that's for sale by owner, but you don't have that much money. But if you contact them and you say, look, we could give a little bit down and we could pay rent and here's our resume and here's, and you never know what the Lord that's can right. do. And you, you, you right. work your way into those uh, positions. But let's move on. We, we keep coming in. So a here, questions. yeah. Uh, well, the, Daisy says, when should we move? And I think that that uh, we're all in agreement that uh, sooner is, is better than later. <laughs> yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. If, if you look at what's happening, now we're not necessarily saying that this is the end, but it, it's, it's interesting. The cities are clamping down, but yet interest rates have never been lower. So that tells me now's the time. Cities are getting hard to live in, interest rates are low, it's time to go. Right, and, and Ron, no human can answer that question. Ultimately, you know, when the question is, when shall we leave? That's a question for God. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to stress uh, is that we need to really be looking to the Lord to guide us. You know, we're, we're not God. We're just human beings. And we've all had our own struggles and we've all stepped out in faith and we've all learned through the ups and downs. And that's the way life is. Yeah. And you did not move into this house on five acres with this garden and orchard and this building. No. You rented, you looked all over the place. We, I mean, it was a, what? It was a three process. year process, two, two to three years. 
bef you know, so it doesn't happen overnight, but you got in. That's right. And the Lord uh, took over. <laughs> That's right. You know, we moved 20 years ago, and at the time, Nancy and I'd talk it over. I'd keep saying, I wish we'd moved years before. Um, so as soon as you can do it, I would do it yeah. so wisely. This, this person asked, uh, could we do a segment on gardening or how to start a garden? So maybe we could send them to a resource. And could they find that on your website? Oh, yes. Okay. In fact, that's why uh, Nick produced uh, numerous DVDs on gardening because we had uh, access to some experts that we had been hearing about for years. And like I said, we knew we needed help with gardening. And so we filmed uh, Bob Jorgensen, who had researched how to put the most nutrition into what you grow. And we felt like that was a very important aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And he had been researching that for 30 years at the time we filled him, filmed him, over mm -hmm. 30 years. And so he did, uh, we did a spring gardening set with him and a fall gardening set. And then with the, the Dysinger family, we have a, a year-round gardening because they do winter gardening uh, as part of a CSA. And then we actually went to uh, Bob Gregory from Berea uh, Gardens mm -hmm. Agricultural Institute, I think it's called. And we had been hearing about him for years, that he knew a lot about uh, hoop houses and, and greenhouse gardening and regular gardening and that he was tr a tremendous teacher and we knew that he offered a course and so uh, I think the course was about five hundred dollars a person at the time and that included your room and board but it was a, like a week-long course and we fit that into one of our seminar trips and Nick our son and Craig and I all took the course and if you were a couple it was a little bit less per person because you shared some of the uh, materials but we felt like this is an investment we we can't afford to have years go by that oh that year we didn't have much of a garden and this happened that year and that one didn't work we need every single year to have a good garden so we put out the money and we didn't have a lot of money but we said this is an investment mm -hmm. and when we finished it was so valuable because his was like a classroom course teaching the principles of gardening how when uh, farmers take up agriculture as an occupation they don't just throw a little of this or a little of that on the garden and hope it works they go about it in a very systematic way that makes sense scientifically and that's exactly what this course uh, that we took from Bob Gregory was. And so when we finished, Nick said to him, would you ever be interested in us filming that? And uh, he said, yes, as a matter of fact, I would. And so we went back and we basically filmed that course that we had, had taken, and that is available for way less than what we took it and because you don't have to. And that's to, on your website. That's on <laughs> our okay. website, which links to, to Sus Prep Nick's okay. website. So that'll be on the PDF. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, the majority of people who are probably uh, listening to us today are in the city and maybe they don't have a garden. Right. Maybe they are in an apartment and uh, you can garden in your house. That's right. Right. You can, you know, you start little seedlings and, and you can grow sprouts. Uh, Steve mm -hmm. and I recently completed a course, Sprouting with Steve. And so, and, and, and the, the benefit of sprouts, obviously, they grow much quicker. You can be eating them in just a couple of days, but now this this is the season to be planning and, and doing a garden. Right. And so, no matter where you are, you should be. Right. You should right. So the so indoor garden sproutingwithsteve.com. Oh that's, yeah. that's, that's our that's our website for us. And that's highly course. nutritious. It way sure way. Is. But as far as the actual gardening, the hands-on uh, with uh, Bob Jorgensen and also the Dysingers is a set called. Uh, this is the gardening set. And then uh, the class that I talked about, because that's six, six DVDs in that set. And then the class has, by Bob <coughs> Gregory, has six DVDs, and it's called Food Growers Guidelines. So there's two different ways. One is more of a hands-on where you see him out there. He's showing you just how to do it and how to do a compost pile and how to do this and even how to, to uh, do many. We have another set called um, Fruit Culture. And in there, he shows how to graft your own fruit trees. Bob Jorgensen does how to um, prune. prune fruit trees, how to grow uh, 
grapes from seedlings and it's just an incredible amount of information that is not something you can put in a book really it mm -hmm. helps to see it done and to see it done by experts who want to share with you and want to give you their years of experience you know we're told that many people will learn in a short time what it took others to to a long time and I think that's true with right. with mm -hmm. these now what is the name of the set that folks can get a discount on that we talked about everything earlier. on the website okay so anything on the website uh, if you just type in the discount code white horse media or white horse I think either one yes. of those two doesn't lowercase doesn't matter altogether you'll get 20% off and free shipping yeah. that's from Nick and Lisa yeah uh, their, their, website. their website sustainable preparedness but if you go to end time preparedness it'll link you to theirs okay. but they're the ones that handle all of that and they've decided to give a, a okay. discount and then free shipping over a certain amount and if you were to go to sproutingwithsteve.com and uh, purchase the course put in friend of Steve and sure. we'll give you 50% mm -hmm. off um, and it's a it's a full hands-on like the like the gardening one so now's the time to be because we're, we're seeing this, the food shortages uh, in, in some of the cities and good time to be sprouting and gardening. So next question. Should we move to a hot or cold area? Well, if you move here, you get both. That's right. It'll be pretty <laughs> hot soon and it was pretty cold <laughs> this winter and I enjoy the four seasons. Yeah, we, we love the seasons up here. And, and again, it's hard for a human to really answer that question. You know, you have to decide what you really what you want to live in. I mean, some people don't want to live up here in the snow. Uh, we get snow every winter, but my family's learned to, to just roll with it. Mm -hmm. And we like it. You know, my, uh, my children love, love the snow. And, and, uh, I can make a stab at it because I was born and raised in hot weather. And now for the last 20 years, we've lived up here, which is cold. But I really appreciate being in an area where the humidity is lower, it is up in this area. We're back in Georgia, it was pretty high where we lived. Also, uh, some of you might relate to this, but um, I like to walk through the woods and not worry about running into a coiled up snake ready to strike. Uh, you hardly, we, where we live, we hardly see snakes and very few ticks, which in the south, we ran into ch chiggers, ticks, snakes, whatever. Also, uh, we've learned in gardening that we have better gardens up here than in the heat of the south where we lived. So it is nice to thaw out at the end of the winter here. Um, but for the most part, we love it up here, and I think, and, and as you know, we average two or three feet of snowpack during the winter. But I think when the time comes, when people might be pouring out of the cities, I believe maybe the Lord will use the snow uh, as a buffer to protect his people in some way. But I'd like to add too that many people are finding places all over the place. We know many people in Tennessee, West Virginia, Maine. Kentucky. Um, warmer areas, Missouri and uh, you just want to go where God has a work for you to do. Yeah. He will put you next to the neighbors you need to be by or wherever. Uh, and it may not be exactly where you started out thinking it would be. It, let me just add, and I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I never dreamed I would be living in a cold climate or cooler climate. Um, I love the South, love Georgia, but I can't live there anymore. Um, I, I definitely couldn't now go back to the heat. Um, it's just very invigorating uh, to me to live in an area where there is a four seasons. I really love that. But like Nancy said, uh, the Lord will help you to adjust to wherever he leads you. He helped me. It took a couple, two or three years, but now my blood's thicker. And I thank the Lord we're here. You'll thank the Lord where you wind up if you follow his will. Amen. <laughs> so literally we're only scratching this. Well, so let's try and well, yeah, let's keep going. Let's let's try and uh, <laughs> whip whip through some of these. Okay. Uh, and if we don't get to these, if we have to end before um, I am going to if you email me at country living uh, at whitehorsemedia.com, I will try and respond 
uh, to your question if we don't get to it. Country Ron will answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> so here we go. I have a question. We run a care home in the city. We do have a house in the country. What should we do? Sell and move to the country? We are caught between family. We are caught in between family and should come first before taking care of the elderly. So it sounds like they're kind of having to weigh what, what they should do. Uh, continue with the care home, home in the city or go ahead and watch out for themselves and, and sell and move out. Tough, tough well, place Tim, to be Tim in. Saxton, who works with us here at Whitehorse Media, he had a, an entire chain of nursing homes and he felt impressed that it was time to sell that chain. So it was a family operation, they sold it. Yeah. And now so he lives like up here. It sounds like this is like a care home where maybe they're taking care of a few people in their own home oh, I as see. opposed to just manage. Like a nursing um, home. So, you know, if, if the people can't go with, maybe make arrangements to find care and not abandon them, obviously. Mm -hmm but you know make that transition right as, as, as the, the bible in. talks about what was it hezekiah when he was sick isaiah said set your house in order yeah. mm -hmm. and setting your house in order doesn't happen instantly it takes time yeah. but again as we as we move in the direction and and the holy spirit impresses people's consciences whoever asked that question if god is speaking to your mind your conscience and impressing you to move forward then he, he will help you set your house in order. He will help you work out those details yeah. mm -hmm. so you can make a transition, especially if you have, uh, if you have children. Yeah. Yeah. Good, okay, next question. Uh, do we have to be physically fit to live in the country? Well, I would say that living in the country will make you I was going to say physically it fit. If you're fitness. not, you will be. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, so lots to do when you're bending down in the garden. You're chopping wood. <laughs> you're, you know, chasing your animals across the neighbor's property or whatever. So <laughs> I'd like to add, Ron, um, the person that wrote this question might be elderly, might not be able to get around, um, and there are plenty of young, able young bucks out there that don't have funds, that need to help someone who might have funds. So it's kind of, it can be a fit. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing, this is another situation where you need to cross the River Jordan and you need to put your foot in to see how the Lord parts the water. So. All I know to say is to leave it with the Lord, exercise faith, move wisely, not rashly, but ask the Lord to help in that situation. And he will, we have found that to be the case. I had a hip replacement last year and I have found ways to get around various duties that um, I need to do around our home and I had a I was in a pretty bad accident also. And the Lord has really helped fill in the gaps that those incidences uh, created. So he'll help you. I know he will, he has helped me. And there's plenty of people that live up here in the country that are elderly and that have a hard time getting around and, and based upon you know, a person's age and their strength, you know, there's not everybody up here can grab a chainsaw and go out and knock down a tree and cut up wood. And, but there's people around here that will help you and, yes. and uh, That's right. they can bring over a truckload of wood yeah. if you can't cut it down. The Lord says, out of the cities, out of the cities. Now ask yourself, is that a suggestion or a command? So uh, Craig alluded to uh, something and this is still in the works it's something we've been praying about um, but other people other ministries have identified people who are elderly who maybe are retired who have means but not sure if they have the energy to quite go out and you know start breaking up land and planting the garden and plowing roads and so what we're wondering is because we have young families who have a lot of energy but don't have the means yet and so we're trying to determine how we can help maybe put those two together in a, in a workable way. 
And so if you are one or other, if you, if you're, if you fit into one of those two camps, again, contact me and I'm, I'm trying to put a plan together and, so that we can help people network, uh, network with people who are already out here, network with people who can complement each other with their issues uh, who haven't yet come out here. So this is all kind of what we're praying. Uh, we just feel like the Lord has uh, put that on our hearts. Uh, we're already out here. We know this is the best place in the end times, and so we want to help people. So be patient with us. But if, if you want to contact us, uh, we're, we're praying that the Lord will help us put those those people together. Ron, a month ago, two months ago, Whitehorse Media was not planning on doing a program today on country living <laughs> and on moving out of the cities. Mm -hmm. It just as things have developed, this corona crisis has unfolded. Yeah. God has led us to do this. He led us to do the last program, Is It Time? He led us to do this one, Practical Steps. and. Uh, we have other ideas for the future, but we're going to let God lead us. And we're thankful Amen. that the Lord is using uh, this program and, and Pastor Ron and Greg and Nancy uh, to stimulate, you know, to stir up the pot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to, uh, it's just like, what was the, you know, the story about the, uh, the mother eagle when she has her little, how does, how does she teach her eaglet to fly? She, you know, pushes it out mm -hmm. and then eventually the eaglet goes down all out of the nest and has to learn how to fly. Yeah. And God seems to be doing that through, uh, through White Horse Media, stirring up the pot and impressing people that they need to think seriously about getting into a better environment for their spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. Elle says, I have an RV on country property that I bought. I have recently developed a rain collection system. What do you recommend for a solar system for an RV resources? Question mark. Cost effective as possible. Well, fortunately for an RV, uh, you could probably get into a solar system, you know, inexpensively compared to, you know, some of the ones we see around here. Um, if I was in that situation, I would jump on YouTube because there isn't hardly anything you can't find. The best solar systems for RV, I'm sure there's probably a lot of videos of, of people telling you, hey, this system is really good. Um, we do have an elder in our church here uh, who installs solar systems. He's not here with us today. Uh, but I would just start by researching online, and I'm sure that you can find uh, some good. And, and, and the, the beautiful thing about those types of sit, uh, setups is you can always expand them. Mm -hmm. You know, That's how we started. Yeah, you get two, one battery, two batteries, and next thing you know, mm -hmm. you can... You know, put another panel, and, and yeah. so maybe that'll be a good way to go. How um, do you think living near the ocean? We were just talking about salt water, so maybe you answer. I will <laughs> give this to you, Nancy. Do you think living near the ocean would be okay? If that's where the Lord leads you, I'm, I am a firm advocate that God has a place for every single one of us, and it's different. It's not all in the same place. He has different places. Uh, Ron is referring to, we were talking about, um, since I'm kind of the gardener in our family, one of the things I'm, I'm really starting to use is something called C90, S-E-A, C90, and it's a supplement for your garden. And it's basically ocean water that's been dried because the ocean has all of the elements in it and the uh, nutrients, nutrients yes, that aren't in a lot of the other fertilizers. And uh, last year, for instance, when our strawberries started uh, producing, and I tasted them, and, and they were good, but they weren't like out of this world. And so I started putting C90 on them, and they were out of this world after that. <laughs> it was well, really I good. It adds to the taste. Think about that, because I've got some strawberries. And mm -hmm. tomatoes and things it like works. that. Very good. <coughs> but as far as living near the ocean, wherever God leads you. Now keep in mind, the wise man built his house upon the rock, yeah. Not the sand. Yeah. So we don't want to get so <laughs> close to the ocean that if there were an earthquake and a tsunami, that That's right. you know your place would be uh, washed away. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you know, just be diligent about that. What are the best states for country living? Now that's a very mm -hmm. broad question, and I'm going to put up this uh, picture on the screen. This is a book that uh, we were talking about a little bit earlier. That um, and here. I think the book on Amazon was like sixty, about seventy, bucks. seventy dollars. Mm -hmm. But here, there's a digital download 
for $15 mm. uh, talking about strategic lo relocation. So in this book, it goes over all the things that you might need to consider while making a decision to moving out. State right? by state. State, state, by, state, state, by, state by state, climate, land mass, water, population, all of that stuff. So maybe uh, write that down as it's on the screen and take advantage of that digital download for only $15. And I think you'll, that's probably got a lot of good information. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there. Wanna, I wanna add, Ron, that that is <clears throat> one of the best, if not the best books that I recommend. Um, they're sold out uh, on the website. Amazon sells a hard copy. They, they haven't indicated that they're sold out, but the digital uh, book is on sale for 15. But this man, uh, I have the first edition, the second edition. This is the third edition. And um, with our experience, this is one of the best practical books in helping you to see what areas I need to look at, what states seem to be better than others. He, this man in this book does not rank um, what states have the best banks, what states have the best golf courses, et cetera, et cetera. He, he, ra he ranks these states from a, pa a practical point of view, which states um, are near missile silos or which states have the lowest tax rates, uh, so many other things. What is the makeup of the citizenry of that state? Uh, is it, um, he compares it to the Constitution. And this is most important. I believe the Constitution was inspired by God. And this book will help you find places that seem to be more constitutional. And I think um, more conducive to religious liberty. Yeah, that's a, that's a good deal there. So every time a question pops up, I lose my place. So let's go down here. Rosie, Rosie asks, a water source, can it be a well? Uh, yes, it can be. And if you have a well, you want to have a hand pump. We were discussing those uh, a little bit earlier. They can be expensive. Uh, but you can search around and, and uh, you know, you can even get a solar pump. I know you, you have a solar pump uh, for one. Yeah. No. It operates off solar. Off, sol off solar. So water's key. Uh, wells are good. We're on a well here. It supplies water for uh, Steve's place and for, uh, I lived in a house that supplied, one well supplied two homes. Uh, our family, my, my father just, Secured a property has a 60 gallon a minute well and it has a nice hydraulic pump already installed and that was almost worth the price of admission when we <laughs> saw that. So um, our family has been praying about moving to the country for a while now, but really ready now. Need to know where. Well, again, that book might be a good resource. Prayer, prayer for prayer. I, I would add this. Uh, maybe it's good to look in a place where you've been before and where you know people so That's that right. you can network. That's right. And, and if you're looking at a place that you've never been, take a trip there as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, we would always, I would always encourage people to come and stay for a weekend. Mm -hmm. And I had about a three hour tour, right? That I would take them on to kind of show them the area, but you'll, you'll have a much better idea after you visit mm -hmm. someplace. Right, and, and the networking is really important, yeah. Ron. It's, our move from California to North Idaho started with me speaking at, a, at an event. And then uh, I, I mentioned one day in front of a crowd, I said, it's so beautiful up here. It was in June, uh, Bonners Ferry, just, just south of uh, the Canadian border in eastern uh, northern Idaho. And I was speaking up there and mentioned, this is such a beautiful place. Uh, I might even like to live here something like that and and that just planted a seed and then some people came to us and said if you're thinking about that check out our property and then we we did we had some extra time checked out their property we met pastor ron and then that led to an invitation to speak in the church and then we discussed uh possibilities and talked to our board and then ron talked to his board and 
and had a business meeting and they, they said that they were willing to open up the church to have Whitehorse Media move into the basement of the church uh, as we were looking for property. And then we began to meet more people and just one step led to another. We didn't, er we didn't ultimately settle on the property that was uh, you know, offered to us as, as something we should look at, but that got the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. And so it was because we knew people up here. We had met people up here. We were beginning to develop friendships and, and networking that the Lord worked through that. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know, that's a very valuable suggestion is you know, who, who do you know and, and where do you know them and talk to them and see if there's other people that you might connect with. Yeah, and someone might say, well, how do I network with an area that I haven't maybe been to? You know, if you identified an area, you could call the local church. You know, if you're affiliated with a church, call the local church, talk with the pastor, say, this is what I'm thinking. Do you know anybody in your congregation? Maybe has a piece of property for sale or that has a place that I could rent. And, you know, just start the ball rolling. That's right. And you'll be amazed at how one thing leads uh, That's right. to another. another. So uh, Jennifer says, I am ready, but I am scared because I am a single African-American mother saddled with a student loan, uh, with student loan debts, etc. What can I do as a single? Oh, there it went. What was her name? Jennifer. Jennifer, here it is. Okay. What can I do as I am single with no male to help me? And we were just talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. That's a well, question you get a lot. There's a wonderful verse to start out with that says, He setteth the solitary in families. Now, you, you say you have um, children, or at least a child. And uh, I remember meeting a single mom one time uh, at, a, at a rally, it was an out of the city's rally, and she was talking to me and she told me something about her girls, she had twin girls and that they were homeschooling. And I said, well, how is that happening? Because she had to work, she had a job. And she said, well, I just prayed and prayed about it. And she said where she was working, it was uh, some kind of a, I don't know if it was an advertising agency or something, and there were some uh, rooms in that office and it was in the city, and uh, there were rooms that were not in use. And she got the idea with when she was praying that maybe she should ask the Lord uh, to work out the homeschooling situation. Well, he did. She was allowed to homeschool, and she used a, um, a Becca, which was videos, because she couldn't be there in the room with the girls the whole day, of course. But that gave her the courage then to say, I, I want to move to the country. Here she is a single mom, she has to work, and she has two girls. And uh, we actually filmed her telling her story on a DVD that we did called Urban Danger. But uh, the bottom line, I remember meeting her at, at uh, some meetings when she told me, she said, I'm, I'm starting to ask the Lord about country living now because I want to <laughs> do country living. And she said, I don't know how I'm going to do it because I have to work as a single mom. But we talked about things and I remember uh, as I was contemplating that afternoon after she had told me about it and I said to her, well, you know, um, Moses' mom in the Bible, I think she got paid to take care of him uh, after the princess had uh, decided to take him on, but then she hired Moses' mom to take care of him. And I said, the Lord can do something. And we prayed. We were in the parking lot there at this, this event. And we prayed there in the parking lot that the Lord would open up something for her. And a few weeks later, she emailed me and she said, you're not going to believe this. She said, I got this email from someone I really didn't even hardly know. And uh, they sent me a link to a realtor's website. And they said, look at this property. And she didn't know what it was all about. Then she got another email and said, this family said, we're looking at this property, but it's more than what we want. And we're wondering if you might want to have a portion of this land with us. And she said, whoa, she was so excited about it. And, but that she had a house to sell. And that's, there's a whole nother story. I'm not going to tell it all. But she ended up there on that property next to this other family. That family helped her and her daughters with things that were difficult for them to do. And they reciprocated by doing things with that family. They had separate pieces of property, but the Lord set it up where they had, they had support there and it worked yeah. out very well. So again, 
there's where there's a will, there's a way. Yes. And especially if the will is the will of our Father. That's right. You Put know. your foot in the water. Yeah. Okay, so Betty says, how far from the city should we go? There are m uh, mediocre places, small towns, etc. So this is a, a common question, and, you know, again, uh, some people, maybe they, they need to get out of the city, but they need to keep their job, and maybe they can go out a, an hour, and, and that's better than they were, right? So, you know, I, I think for, for us, we agreed that we wanted to get out a little bit more, um, uh, but what do you think? How far should someone go and is just a little bit out better than not at all? Well, <clears throat> always take it before the Lord. He'll show you right where you need to go. He'll close doors to direct you to that area. But you need to size up where you are now. Uh, we have a friend um, classmate of Nancy's. They used to live in a large city and it'd take her I think an hour to hour and a half to get to her job in the city, one part of the city to the next. And they finally moved out of the city I think less than an hour I think, maybe an hour out of the city. And what a blessing that is to be out of the cities. Um, I think, well, it, it just, it's wherever the Lord leads you. It can be various places, but you just need to remember um, you don't want to be in the city where you're going to be um, stuck in traffic all the time. All of the impressions, all the influences of the city even even if it is only a short distance out, um, I don't know. It would just be how the Lord leads you. So right. Let me ask you this, Steve. So mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about moving out of the cities for various reasons, but one of the main reasons that we're saying that we should be leaving the cities is because of what? Because de destruction is coming upon the cities. And if that's the case, and these cities start to experience the judgments of God, being out away from the cities more than just an hour is very preferable in my mind. Mm -hmm. Because when the cities start to experience problems, and there's whatever, yeah. you, can, you can fill in the blank, people are going to, and so the further out you are, the, the better off you're going to be. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, are we at that time where, because we were, we were, we were encouraged and counseled to move out of the cities to the, the rural places first, and then you know it's kind of a progression. Right. But in my mind, we're kind of progressed down that road a little bit, and so, you know, I would personally advise to move out a little further if possible, within reason. You still got to work. You still have to, you know, do things or medical, uh, whatever. But uh, more than just, yeah, the, let's just get to a suburb. I would say that it's time to get out further. Were you going to? I, I was just going to mention the, the process of finding that place just reminds me of the Israelites in the wilderness. They, you know, they set up camp and the, the uh, power of God, the light, you know, came down on the sanctuary and they, they had a cloud by, by day and a pillar of fire by night. And it settled there for a while, and then they, that's where they pitched camp. Mm -hmm. And then, but there was a time when God said, okay, it's time to move. And the cloud lifted, and then they knew, time to pack up and go. And then when the cloud stopped, and then when the cloud settled again, <coughs> that's where they, they pitched camp. And I just think the principle of God leading us is, is a vital principle that we have, like we're saying over and over again, we have to look to God. We have to let him lead us. He knows exactly where he wants a person and mm -hmm. let him lead to that spot. If the cloud is lifting, follow the cloud. And then when it settles, you'll know this is the place. Right. I would just add one more thing <coughs> from a practical point of view. I would move far enough out where you're not on a street that has city water underneath. I'd move out where you had to at least yeah. have a well. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you move out and it looks like the country at the time, uh, you still see these fire hydrants 
out there. That means they're coming from a developer's point of view. That means that's going to grow up because it's going to develop because the water's already there. That's an attraction to developers. And we've talked to so many people who have moved out and they say time and time again, I wish I would have moved out farther yeah. because the city moved out to encompass them. Yeah. Julian says it would be great to know some areas where people are actually practicing country living. And so obviously we're in the Pacific Northwest and almost everybody we know up here practices country living, even the people in town. Our town has what, 2,000 population here? 1,754 in Priest River. Okay, <laughs> so um, that's country living. To, 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 to city a lot folk. of people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're right on the outskirts of Priest River and we're up yeah. against a big mountain. We talk about, you mentioned that view that your son has. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like we've got that view at our property too. We look out and I see the mountains and the snow and the pine trees all around our property. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just gorgeous and it's worth the extra effort. It is. Steve, you and I travel and everywhere we travel we run into people who are country living. Yeah. So it's not just the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Sure. There's, you know, uh, people everywhere. I know people down in New Mexico who have quite elaborate country living and gardens and all mm -hmm. kinds of things. So um, good question here from Hill. Can we still buy seeds online? And we visited a website mm -hmm. that you were talking about just before we came on the air and they're closed right now because of the this coronavirus and probably all the people who are buying the seeds, they will be coming back up on the 13th of this month. So again, that that website was rareseeds.com. Rareseeds .com. Rareseeds.com. We buy our seeds for sprouting from trueleafmarket.com, which is also experiencing uh, some heavy delays because everybody's buying you know, because they're seeing the handwriting on the wall. This is uh, a good wake up call to people yeah. who have a garden yeah. to save their own seeds. I, I save some of my seeds. I haven't been as diligent as I will be this year, but something that's, that was interesting to me because I just planted my, my seeds for seedlings indoors um, in the last few weeks. And uh, there's a certain type of tomato that I really, really liked. And I knew that this Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, which is the rareseeds.com website, I knew that they weren't carrying it anymore. And so I saved seeds from that tomato, uh, variety of tomatoes last year. And when I planted them this year, they were the first ones to spring up. They were the most lively, the most viable. And that was a good lesson to me that, you know, and other things that I've planted from the seeds I've collected are really good seeds and they come up very well. So it's a, it's a lesson to those of us who haven't fully gotten into the seed saving um, entirely yeah. to do it this year because we've seen what happens when you may not be able to. And you're talking about non-hybrid heirloom, heirloom seeds. Heirloom, heirloom. And this company specializes in that. Yeah. Well, any seed might be, uh, my advice would be, uh, skip past the toilet paper aisle and go look for seeds <laughs> because that's really what we should be, that's we should right. be buying. Here's a young person who says, uh, how are we young people with not enough money to buy five acres of land to make the transition to move into the country? What is your advice? Well, I have a 21 year old son. And so I know that, uh, you know, how broke a college kid can be. <laughs> or even someone coming out of college who has student loans. But sometimes the younger single people have it a little easier because they're not tied down. That's right. They don't have, you know, a, fa a growing family maybe yet. They don't have a mortgage and all these bills, maybe you have student loans, but they're very, they're very mobile. And they could go live in a bedroom at someone's property and work as a caretaker, or they could offer their services and, you know, they're, they're they're more uh, able to do that. Mm -hmm. You might not get that five acres right away, but you can at least get out and, and look around a little easier than someone who has got a little bit more under the belt, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes. What wouldn't you add? Oh, yeah, just put it on the line with <coughs> the Lord and hang on, because yeah. uh, you're gonna see miracles. If, you, if your faith is strong and you're truly 
uh, wanting to do what he wants us to do, to obey him, he will open the yeah. way in amazing ways. A lot of these young people, they'll go to Europe for a year, mm -hmm. travel around, backpack, get out into a rural area and start networking and offering your services and you'll be amazed at you know, what you might be able to find. To the person that wrote that question, uh, maybe you weren't online uh, when I told the story about our son Nick, didn't have two nickels to rub against each other, but he went out, he started, he started that car and the Lord was steering. He didn't find anything, but it, finally he did. And make a long story short, he's now on 10 acres, uh, married, has a couple of children, and they're gonna have it, their home, their property, and a large barn paid off uh, in less than a year now. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, again, about this book and the title of the book. So I'll hold it up here so you can see. Sustainablepreparedness.com is where they could order the book. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so there it is. All right, a uh, question from Kimberly. Is St. John's, Arizona okay for country living two hours outside of Phoenix towards the border of New Mexico or northern Arizona? We were just outside of Arizona, Phoenix, and uh, looked pretty dry and deserty to me. But again, if you're two hours away from a population center and you can find a place to have your own water, uh, grow a garden, You've got to have water. Yeah, got to have water. And um, so not, not really familiar with St. John's, but uh, again, following the, the guidance that we've talked about here earlier. That sounds like it's a little north of Taos, maybe west of Reliance, New Mexico. Um, we looked at land in Reliance years ago before we moved up here. And... Um, you only found trees at higher elevations. Um, anyway, the Lord directed us away from that area. That might be different for you, uh, whoever's, whoever wrote this uh, question. So uh, there, there's a question from Sylvana who says, do you have any advice for a single mom and family? So I think we already uh, addressed that. I don't live in the country and my concerns increase every day, not for the lack of faith, but because I have two little girls. If I don't have money to move, what can I do? So again, here's someone that needs to just go to their knees and say, okay, Lord, I know what you did. You know, to all these people that I read about in the Bible, my desire is to protect my kids and to live in the country. And the Lord already has an answer. That's right. Uh, That's right. For that person. And again, uh, for those of you who maybe um, would like to be a part of our growing uh, resource, uh, email me. I'm starting to keep track of people and, and their specific needs. We'll contact outside of this forum. And maybe as the Lord leads, uh, we're able to uh, give you more direction and maybe. Uh, network with people who are already up here. And I, th I think uh, Urban Danger, I think it had its own website and I think it's still available yes. to watch online. And if, if you are a mom with two little girls, I think you would really relate to one of the stories on that DVD uh, called Urban Danger. Go to urbandanger.com and I believe you can watch it there. So this is a good question. It's one that um, I've, I've had with people within my circle of friends. Is now the time to get in debt for a property? Is that the, if, if that is the only way that we could obtain a country property? Interest rates are at record low. If that's the way that they can get into uh, a country property, is that the right thing to do? Yeah, I think, as you've talked about, the ultimate goal is to get out of debt. Right. But that's, a, that's an ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, most of us, and that not all of us, but most of us have mortgages. And we're, you know, my family, we're still paying down on our mortgage. We've mm -hmm. been paying it down for 11 years and the end is in sight. But, you know, we have a mortgage and a lot of people have mortgages. And uh, taking out a loan to buy a piece of property, you know, is not against the will of God. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a wise thing to do if you, 
can do it. If it'll and get you get out. a good interest rate and get a you know good price on the mm -hmm. the property, and then make your you sacrifice to put more money on principal if you can. And we're we're trying right now in this uh, time of low interest rates to try to refinance. We're still waiting on Bank of America to see what's going to happen, but. Um, you know, you just have to, as you mentioned, uh, not move rashly, but be prudent, be wise, yes. uh, take many factors into consideration. And if you can get a, you know, a, a good loan and a good, good deep rate with low payments on a good piece of property, I wouldn't let that hold you back. Yeah. Especially owner financing. I'm sorry. Oh, owner oh. financing is a wonderful yes. thing to, to yeah. look into also. That can work, sorry. owner financing. Um, uh, we have that question a lot. And one thing I say, it, well, first of all, I'd rather get out of debt. Do the best you can to get out of debt. But like the, the person that wrote the question in said, uh, it doesn't sound very likely at this point. So I would say I'd rather be in debt in the country than in debt in the city. Yeah. So this uh, question is about gardening. Do we have any advice? Or for someone wanting to garden in Australia. Again, I think the online resources are good, whether you're in Australia or uh, I anywhere. So, um, and I've actually been watching as I got involved with sprouting and growing microgreens, of course, on the side, here's all these other <laughs> gardening ones. And, and I help manage a garden now. I help with Steve when he's away and I can get out there and actually if I want to find Steve early in the morning I got to go out to the garden because <laughs> he's out there and, and uh, it's it's a great place to be um, so here's another question is it okay to move to a place where your nearest neighbors are not of the same faith governments are encouraging people to turn others uh, in regarding COVID right we've heard of that we were talking about the, the call to publicly shame people who are not following yeah. uh, and all of that. What would be, would it be dangerous to live near non-believers? All of the people that surround us. There's a five acre piece <coughs> that direction and then this direction, that direction. And we know most of our neighbors right now, we've had developed good friendships with them. We take, my family takes walks and various things happen and we, uh, and my neighbor down the street lets me cut wood from his property because it helps clear out the wood that he doesn't want. And uh, I think that having neighbors, hopefully they're good neighbors, if they're you know not uh, of the same faith that we are part of, that's that's an opportunity to be a witness, to get to know people, to yeah. right. to help them, to share your faith as the Lord leads. And so, you know, I, I definitely don't think the Lord has a a requirement. He does have a requirement for marriage. He says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, but I've never read anywhere where it says, don't move next to somebody that is an yeah. unbeliever. Yeah. You know, that's, that's going beyond inspiration. And it gives us the opportunity to witness. That's right. That's, that's right. right. And um, we have wonderful neighbors. Um, as a matter of fact, we, as we were coming back, um, after we had to cancel our last seminar trip uh, because of the coronavirus, um, we knew there would be a couple of feet of snow on our driveway. So I called our neighbor and um, he said, hey, no problem. Now, I asked him how deep it was and all. You think we'll get in or whatever? He said, no problem. I've got my backhoe. I'll get out and clear it out for you. And that's after you came over and plowed for us. So he cleared it out up to our gate. And uh, it was wonderful. Uh, we have wonderful neighbors. Now, years past, we had a bad apple. But you know, we're where we are because the Lord led us there. We asked him to lead us. And when a bad apple popped up, um, I'm not gonna say how, but the Lord took care of that situation. It's amazing how he took care of it. Well, that wraps up our question, Steve, and that is about perfect timing. Okay. So, uh, again, if you didn't get your question answered, I think I got most of them there, <coughs> or if you come up with some other uh, questions that you may have, uh, contact me at countryliving at whitehorsemedia.com. I've been working with a couple of individuals. We've been 
looking at different properties on Craigslist and Zillow and talking about some of the specific areas in our area, not to say that this is the only place to move, certainly wherever the Lord leads you, but um, if you need help in maybe knowing how to look around and find those good deals, uh, we'd be more than happy to help mm -hmm. you. So. Thank you, Ron and there. Craig and Nancy. Uh, this has been a blessing, <coughs> and we hope you've been blessed by listening to this very casual, informal, and uh, informative conversation. I'd like to read a text and then just share a couple of other thoughts. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, again says, In all your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. And that's the key, is acknowledging God, looking to God, trusting in God, and just spreading it out, spreading your life out before the Lord. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. And that's, yeah. the, that's the divine promise. Again, we're just humans, we have our opinions, but uh, God has promised in His book that He will direct your path to where He wants you to be. And that's what's most important. So we hope this has been enlightening and uh, stirred you up if you live in the city that this uh, is a perfect time to consider making a move and to let God lead you. Uh, our next program, before we have prayer, is uh, in a couple days from now. And who knows uh, you know, when it will be if you watch the replay. But as of this moment, we are just a, a weekend away from from a big Sunday event, uh, Easter Sunday, Christians around the world are going to be networking and trying to get together uh, online mostly uh, for this, this event. And we're going to do a program uh, this coming Saturday, our next program, uh, 10 o'clock. It's on the 11th, April 11, coming up in a few days. And here's our title. It's called Corona Crisis, Easter Sunday, and Sunday Laws. <coughs> So we've got a lot to share. It's going to be uh, very interesting. Uh, we'll share things from the Word of God and talk about what Bible prophecy predicts about the future. So we hope that you will join us for our next live event, Corona Crisis Easter Sunday and Sunday Laws. So stay tuned. Uh, come back and let's pray. Let's pray for you. We want to pray for you and for your questions that the Lord will uh, lead all of you and all of us in the days ahead. Dear Father in heaven, Father God, we look to you. We are but men, we are but little people, but you are a big God and you created this world, you made this planet, and surely there are places uh, in this world that are not safe, that are not healthy, that are not good for your, your people, your children to be living in, and there are better places, uh, this side of heaven. We know that ultimately the new earth is gonna be the, the best place. But while we're still here, we pray that you will guide us and, and guide those who have asked their questions. A lot of sincere questions. People are struggling. They don't know uh, what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't know where you want them to be. But they sense that uh, this, is a, this is a time to make a move into a better environment, to be closer to Jesus. And so, Lord, we just pray for all the people that have watched this and those that will be watching and those that sent in their questions. Please guide them directly. We, we claim your promise in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that if we trust in you and acknowledge you, that you will direct our paths. And so we pray that for everyone that is tuned in today and those who will be watching in the future. Lord, direct their paths. Bless us all. Help us all in these difficult days to be as close to you as possible and to prepare for what is coming upon the earth to stand for you during the final crisis, to be on Jesus Christ's side, and to be ready for your return. We pray these things in the name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen.